Thank you, Dr. Coulter. And it is a, an honor to be able to present this. And to be completely honest, um, making this presentation, you learn a lot when you have to present something because you know you have to be the one that is the expert in the room. And I think it's true that a lot of us don't really know much about how we treat pregnant patients um, with hypertension because quite frankly, it's just not that common that we are the one seeing them. Um, especially in adult cardiology, our patients are generally not of childbearing age. So I think this is really important for maybe the few patients that you do see that, um, you know, might be younger with hypertension, um, especially the African-American population where um, hypertension seems to be more prevalent at a younger age. Okay, so uh, I have a little warm-up. I hope by the end of this talk we can answer these questions or at least come close to getting the answers to these questions. Um, we have a 36-year-old uh, woman with no past medical history. Um, she underwent in vitro uh, fertilization and became pregnant with twins. At her 21-week appointment, her OB uh, noticed that her blood pressure was elevated to 155 over 85. Uh, for an OB, this is not going to be surprising. They probably see this a handful or more times every day. Um, but for us, um, let's talk about some questions that we maybe don't know the answers to. Um, what is her likely diagnosis besides hypertension? What type and why? What's the most common form of high blood pressure when you're pregnant? What next steps do we need to take if you're the first person seeing her besides calling her OB and letting them know? Um, what might you be able to start uh, doing in your clinic or your office? And then what medications, if any, should, should, be, should, should she be prescribed? Immediately postpartum, what's she at risk for? And then in the long term, you know, 10, 20 years from now, what is she at risk for when she's in her 50s or 60s? So today, aside from answering those questions, a quick rundown. I know you guys have heard a lot about hypertension today, but just to beat it one more time, um, to be the dead horse, we're going to talk about the guidelines one more time, or just the basis of why we have the new update in the guidelines. Um, what is the prevalence and the importance of screening for hypertension in pregnancy? Why does it actually matter so much, and why do the OBs really care? Why should we really care? Um, what is the physiology that might be part of the cause of why this, these things happen or what should we expect in normal pregnancy? Um, and then we will discuss each type of hypertension, uh, hypertensive disease in pregnancy, hopefully the diagnosis, uh, the management, the prognosis, et cetera, and then work up um, and the treatment options for all of those. Um, and then we'll just briefly talk about uh, fetal outcomes in moms with high blood pressure and mom outcomes as well. So the basics, one more time, I'm sure you've seen this. Um, what is hypertension? So we have that 2017 update um, that was already talked about uh, this morning by Dr. Taylor. Um, and Dr. Aguilar, Aguilar touched on that a bit too. But just, just to remember, at least in my brain, it's easy just to remember. If you're normal if you're less than 120 over 80. That's normal. Um, anything above that is abnormal. And I think that's important to tell patients, um, especially since the last um, hypertensive by, or blood pressure guidelines a few years ago. You know, everyone said, well, you know, my blood pressure is 140 over 80, and my doctor said that's fine. And it's really hard to have that discussion, um, especially with your patients who don't want any more meds, that, okay, yes, we weren't lying. We thought it was fine, but now we have more data. And it's important that since we have that data, that you use it. And and whatever we can do to make our patients live longer, I think it's important for them to understand we're not just pill pushing. We want to, you know, increase or decrease their morbidity and mortality. So just telling them, okay, what was fine three years ago isn't fine anymore um, is a hard pill to swallow, but I think an important one for us to tell our patients. Um, of course, um, the patients for sure in clinic with Dr. Coulter, I heard this at least once or twice. No, no, my blood pressure is never this high. It's actually just when I come here. And I think the best response to that that I found is, I totally believe you because it might be true. But to prove it to me, just go home, check your blood pressure in the morning, in the afternoon, or in the you know mid-morning, in the evening, and just show it to me the next time you come. And some people are really surprised. They're like, oh, it's actually high at home, and I, I, thought, it, I thought it was way better than this. Or they'll bring back a log that's completely normal, and you're like, okay, fine. You win. I'm not going to give you any meds, but um, it's um, important that you work with the patient so that they don't feel like you're just trying to give them more meds. 
Um, so the basics, um, I'm sure that everyone knows Sprint or at least has a general idea of what exactly this Sprint trial was, but why, why the blood pressure cutoffs? Why did we make the changes? Well, of course, there's compel compelling data more recently that um, a tighter blood pressure control is better than a more lenient um, blood pressure. So the Sprint study in brief, just like the quick hitter on this, is um, they put people into two categories. We're going to either tightly control you with a systolic less than 120 or we're going to let be a little more lenient, less than 140. They had almost 10,000 patients. So it was a large, large study. And it was a five-year planned, five-year follow-up. Um, and actually the medium follow-up was 3.26 years. Um, for a reason you will shortly find out on my next slide. Um, the inclusion criteria, um, greater than or equal to 50, they had high blood pressure, and at least one risk factor for heart disease. Um, the caveat to this was diabetics were not included. Um, the primary outcome, which was a composite, was basically any ACS, a heart attack, a stroke, any um, CV event was the primary outcome, and the secondary outcomes, which were um, selected Pretty, um, it was a pretty good way to kind of group the secondary outcomes as mortality, which um, we'll see shortly was important for them. And then the side effects to tighter blood pressure control, which everyone was kind of thinking those might outweigh the benefits. But syncope, hypotension, renal function getting worse from having um, episodes of hypotension and hyponatremia. So the two groups, the intensive group, um, the ones that they were targeting less than 120, their, their average or their mean blood pressure is actually 121.5 systolic, and then the lenient group was 134.6. Um, the average meds they were on, 2.8 for the intensive group, and then 1.8 for the lenient group. So an, an additional pill per day um, on average for the patients that were in tight control. Um, the trial was stopped early, which is really awesome when I think it's great and exciting when trials are stopped early because that means there must be a really good benefit. There must be a really compelling reason why they wanted to stop this trial, which was probably a lot of money um, early. So why was it stopped early? Well, the primary outcome, um, there was a 5.2 versus 6.8% um, in, the, in the more tight versus lenient control for the primary outcome. Um, it was driven, which is an important part, by CV death and heart failure. So two very um, concerning things that we all um, are motivated to decrease. So those are two important endpoints of the composite. Um, and the number needed to treat was pretty reasonable, actually. For the primary outcome, 61. Um, death from any cause, about 90. And then death from CV cause, 172, so a bit higher. The secondary outcomes in red here, the one that was the most important, mortality, was also significant. So mortality was decreased in the more tightly controlled blood pressure group. Um, here on the left, you can see the primary outcome here. Um, they diverged early, which is why they could stop the trial early. At about one year, you could see them diverge, the, um, uh, the composite endpoint. Intensive treatment group was improved early. Same death from any cause. It took a little longer. You could see a divergence here at about two years. All right, and they did, of course, the subgroup analysis. Um, just for completion, I thought I would add this here, but in almost all of these um, subcategories for patients, almost all of them, um, except for here you'll see fem female, um, more tight, tighter control was better. So that's another important part of this trial. So now that we talked about hypertension and what is it for normal, quote unquote, normal people, non-pregnant people, um, let's switch over to what this talk is going to be more aimed at, and it's pregnant people. So again, like Dr. Coulter said, it's very different, the definitions we use for pregnant um, women compared to the general population. So what the, the big numbers to remember, severe hypertension in a pregnant woman is 160 over 110, greater than or equal to 160 over 110. They call mild hypertension when it's 140 or over 90 or lower, and then moderate is there in the middle. So why these cutoffs, you might ask. Um, of course, um, as it, at the beginning, as we talked, most pregnant women are younger. So the risk of letting their blood pressure be a little bit higher for a brief period of time seems to be reasonable. And then, of course, the, the risk versus benefit of um, over-treating a pregnant woman who's, you know, growing a baby and hypoperfusing that placenta. Uh, is the, the risk really worth it um, versus the benefit of, a, you know, nine months of blood pressure control? Um, 
This has been looked at, as you guys I'm sure can um, expect multiple times, and the data is very conflicting. Um, but nonetheless, we still have these cut. We still have these cutoffs. So 160 over 110. Um, another thing to remember is yes, all blood all blood pressure medicines cross the uh, blood brain barrier. So there's nothing you don't. It's like Dr. Coulter always says you. There, there's never free lunch, or you know, you never really can give a therapy or do a treatment and not have some sort of side effects. Um, so briefly, some of that conflicting data that I just talked about on, um, you know, why or why not the blood pressure is a tighter um, cutoff. So the CHIP study, which was done in I think 2015, control of hypertension in pregnancy. Um, study had 981, so almost 1,000 pregnant women, and they either um, categorized them into a strict, like a strict blood pressure control versus more lenient, and their cutoffs were diastolic blood pressure. So they did a diastolic group of less than 85 and a diastolic group of less than 100, um, and they followed them. This is the mean difference in blood pressure for the systolic was 5.8, and the diastolic was 4.6 because. As you can imagine, when you give someone a blood pressure medicine to control diastolic blood pressure, it's also going to affect your systolic. So we would have expected the um, difference to be um, difference in both. Um, the outcomes in the tighter control group, so the women that had the diastolic goal that was less than 85, they actually had, as we might expect, uh, reduced severe maternal hypertension, which is correlated with events in the mom. If you have severe hypertension, you have poor outcomes. Um, so that's a, pos a positive thing. And um, it actually, interestingly, didn't, the medicines, the therapies did not increase the risk of the small for gestational age in the baby. So it didn't make the baby super small after you were treating them with a couple of blood pressure meds. Um, the less tight control group, they actually had, um, uh, of course, as you'd expect, more patients develop severe hypertension. So in those group, in that group of females who did develop severe hypertension greater than 160 over 110, they had a higher rate of preterm delivery. They had um, babies with a lower birth weight, and they had a higher rate of, as you might expect, serious maternal morbidity due to having that super high blood pressure, having um, more preeclampsia, or having HELP syndrome, the progression of um, preeclampsia. So despite all this, um, the cutoffs for pregnancy, hyperten hypertension and pregnancy still remain a little bit conservative, so we're still not anywhere near changing the cutoffs for the blood pressure goals during pregnancy. But like all things in cardiology, like our blood pressure guidelines um, in adult cardiology, um, who knows to say like maybe in two years or next year, we might be talking about a new blood pressure cutoff if there's more data. Um, so here are the facts. The most important part of, I think, this talk is why do we care so much? So hypertensive disorders in pregnancy, um, they complicate up to 15% of pregnancies. Um, so, you know, almost you know, one in five women will have some sort of hypertensive disorder while they're pregnant. Um, and it's a major cause of morbidity and mortality in women that are pregnant. So up to 10 to 15% 15, 15 of all maternal deaths are due to these hypertensive disorders. Um, the mom risks that we could talk about the stroke, the intracranial hemorrhage, the placental abruption, preeclampsia, and of course, organ failure, which is associated with preeclampsia and eclampsia. Um, and just in case you don't know, the uh, placental abruption, since you know, most of us don't deal with pregnant people often, is just um, there's a hemorrhage in the lining of the placenta, which disconnects the placenta from the uterus, which causes not only harm to mom, bleeding, but can actually threaten the baby's life as well. So it's a big deal. Um, the risk to the baby for uh, the hypertensive disorders, heart dis congenital heart disease, so defects, growth restriction, preterm labor, and uterine death, and then of course prematurity. Um, if if mom develops a life threatening uh, hypertensive syndrome that needs that requires the baby to be delivered, which is usually um, uh, the definitive treatment for preeclampsia that's severe anyway. So our goal as uh, general practitioners, cardiologists, OBs, et cetera, we are trying to help both reduce the morbidity and the mortality um, for moms and babies that have the dis these disorders. Uh, the screening, of course, USPSTF recommends, uh, it's a grade B recommendation, which I thought I would just stick that out there. That's where it lays right now, but everyone is screened for preeclampsia, and we'll talk about what exactly um, that screening is or what labs you need or what tests actually are the screening.
Um, so before we get started, in general, in pregnancy, the heat, there's lots of hemodynamic changes, among other things happening in the mom's body. But I just want to point out, it's pretty, um, the only thing, lots of things change, but the only thing, usually they all go up. You have an increase in plasma volume, an increased cardiac output, an increased heart rate. Lots of things go up, but the only thing that goes down really is um, your systemic vascular resistance. So you might say, wow, most people then should be a little hypotensive or relatively hypotensive during pregnancy, and that's kind of true. Most people, their blood, their blood pressure drops. Even if, the, if they're borderline hypertensive, like you might be monitoring their blood pressure in the clinic, when they get pregnant, their blood pressure might be really normal, which is... Um, something to keep an eye, you know, keep an eye on for them. Um, or if you're treating someone who has borderline high blood pressure and they get pregnant, of course, you might have to back off. Um, but it, these are all the changes in the cardiovascular system that take place um, from, from conception all the way to postpartum. And you can notice here that at postpartum, um, your uh, SVR is still not up to where you started immediately after you give birth. So um, what is the workup for all the people, all pregnant women who have hypertension, any hypertension? They're in your office for the first time and they have an elevated blood pressure. Well, of course, like everything in medicine, a thorough history um, and physical is the first step. Um, do they have concerning sy symptoms now? Do they have a family history that's concerning? Was mom and sister and your other sister, were they all preeclamptic? These are all important pieces of the history um, for a new hypertensive pregnant woman. Um, and then, of course, we move on to more of the objective data, the labs. Every female that's pregnant will have a quanti with especially with hyperten hypertension diagnosis, will get a quantitative analysis of urine protein. So what does that mean? It's a protein to creatinine ratio on a single sample or a 24-hour protein, protein collection from urine, which is really annoying. Um, we recently had someone <laughs> that we sent to do that carry a jug around for 24 hours. Not many people want to do that, but it's um, actually the first recommendation. Um, and then, of course, if you're in a place where you might not have these available, which is rare here in the U.S., and um, you could do a dipstick. And if there's a large amount of protein, 4+, plus, then you can say, surely there's something bad going on. But it's recommended quantitative. And then next, you will always get a CMP and a CBC. And the reason you're going to get that is because they those play roles in the diagnosis of what type of hypertensive disorder the patient has. A CMP, you're mainly looking for renal function and liver function. And then the CBC, you're looking for platelets. So let's start off with the big offender, preeclampsia. It's the biggest, um, the biggest group of hypertensive disorders that complicate pregnancy. It might not be the most common disease in hypertens uh, hypertensive disease in pregnancy, but it's the one that complicates the most. It's in five to seven percent of pregnancies, which is actually relatively common if you think about it. I'm sure we all have, we can all name one person we know that was preeclamptic. Um, and there's lots of risk factors, nulliparity, having prior preeclampsia, having, like I said, a family history of uh, preeclampsia, having some sort of autoimmune disease, which you'll see shortly might play into the etiology of why people have this disorder. Um, and then, of course, if you have chronic hypertension, you're at higher risk of having complications leading to preeclampsia. Um, advanced maternal age and obesity, of course, uh, are risk factors as well. And as women start having babies later, which is now that more women are, you know, furthering, getting, going to college and, you know, waiting to start families, we're going to see this more often. I'm sure the OBs have already noticed this. Um, so why does it happen? This is a fun, um, fun little, like, mind game. No one actually really knows the real reason why it happens, but there are multiple theories. And if you look at the risk factors, you might be able to extrapolate how they, um, how they cause this disorder. So why would someone with lupus, an inflammatory disease, be more prone to have preeclampsia? Well, preeclampsia might have something to do with inflammation, inflammation in your vessels. So people have made theories about this. The, the major, um, the end of the road is preeclampsia is endothelial dysfunction. And the most common um, accept, or most accepted theory of why it happens is in this cute little cartoon that I found. So why, why does it happen? Well, you have some sort of defective spiral where you have inflammation from whether it be lupus or you have a genetic predisposition, et cetera, et cetera, or you have a placenta that's being hypoperfused and you're releasing 
inflammatory uh, cytokines and inflammatory mediators, they all have effect on mom, leading to the blood vessels becoming dysfunctional or are tighter or less relaxable, um, which then has downstream effects on your, the end organs, the kidneys, the liver, the brain. Um, but it's a, it's a whole body kind of uh, domino effect. It's not just um, the blood vessels. It's all organs, which has uh, implications for monitoring mom and monitoring um, her symptoms very closely. So how do we diagnose the preeclampsia? This goes back to um, what, what's the blood pressure cutoff, and it has um, what are the results of those labs that you had ordered or you had the OB ordered. So the blood pressure cutoff is greater than or equal to 140 over 90 after 20 weeks of gestation um, in a patient that was previously normotensive. Um, and they will have to have the protein in their urine above the cutoff. 0.3 protein to creatinine ratio are greater than 300 milligrams a day if you do that wretched 24-hour um, collection. Um, if they don't have the protein or proteinuria, then the other um, could have this is the platelets less than 100,000, uh, creatinine that's 1.1 or double of what their normal creatinine is. If their LFTs are much higher than they should be, two times upper limit normal or they have visual disturbances, cerebral symptoms, pulmonary edema. And these are all things that you guys might remember, HELP syndrome. Um, I'm not going to dive deep into HELP syndrome, um, but those are all the complications of HELP, uh, HELP syndrome, low platelets, elevated LFTs, um, hemolysis, et cetera. So if you, even if the woman is not, um, she doesn't have a protein ratio that meets your cutoff, she still might have preeclampsia. So don't just dismiss that. Um, make sure you pay attention to the other lab studies that you've ordered as well and her um, symptoms. Um, so the management, again, we're really lenient with pregnant women. We want the blood pressure to be less than 160 over 110. That sounds crazy. If someone walks into our clinic, we're like, oh, my God, 160 over 110, what are you doing? Like, but for pregnant women, this is what we allow. Um, as long as they don't have end organ damage. Um, if they do need blood pressure medicines, we all, I'm sure, can remember there's a big three, a little triad that we all, if we've seen pregnant women on blood pressure meds, it's methyl dopa, which weakish, weak, um, labetalol and nifedipine. And Dr. Coulter, I've had, um, I've been able to help take care of some of her pregnant patients that have high blood pressure um, on many meds, not just one or two, but nifedipine seems to do quite the job. It's probably the best and the strongest if you're looking for bang for your buck. Um, and it's a first line agent now. Um, if that's, if it's a high risk patient with preeclampsia, like they've had uh, multiple pregnancies with preeclampsia, or they have a history of early labor, uh, premature delivery, um, you can consider a low dose aspirin. And that's kind of like how we were talking about the lady, um, that Dr. Pistallion was just discussing. Low dose aspirin is actually okay for pregnancy and ACOG, the American College of uh, Obstetrics and Gynecology approves of its use. So, um. You can consider that for the higher risk preeclamptics. And if they are severely preeclamptic and you can't control their blood pressure or they have some end organ damage, they need to go to the hospital and get IV, uh, labetalol, nicardipine, magnesium, et cetera. Um, the, how does the preeclampsia kind of tie in with the heart, um, since that's what we're here for anyway? Um, you have all the things that we've discussed in the presentations prior. You have a stiff vessels, which can lead to, lead to high blood pressure, which the high blood pressure leads to a stiff heart and diastolic dysfunction. And then you have, maybe you have a little bit of MR, and when you add on the high blood pressure and a stiff heart, now you have more MR. So what seems to be just a pregnancy induced disorder or you know state of being can also have real implications on how your patient feels because the heart's also feeling it as well. Um, so things to look for in an echo in a, in a pregnant patient who's symptomatic, um, short of breath out of proportion to just having a large pregnant uterus is um, the diastolic dysfunction, the RVSP, RV systolic pressure, um, and the overall function, which can be affected. Um, definitive therapy, of course, for this disorder is delivery. And the ACOG um, and their guidelines try very hard to keep the woman pregnant as long as possible until they, until they really need her to deliver the baby so that the mom, the risks of delivering the baby early um, don't outweigh the benefits of keeping her pregnant.
Okay, so what is superimposed preeclampsia? This is kind of a complicated topic because it's patients who have chronic hypertension, so they have hypertension before they got pregnant, and or gestational hypertension, what they develop when they're pregnant, that is then superimposed by, pre or they, in addition, develop preeclampsia. It can be difficult to tease out, especially in the chronic hypertensive patients, um, but up to 10% of the chronic hypertension patients might have preeclampsia without the proteinuria. So it's that group of patients that doesn't fit, um, you know, isn't the cookie cutter preeclamptic. It's a patient who you've seen in the clinic for a while, um, but their blood pressure starts to creep up. And it, it either creeps up to a point where it's like, wow, you only required two blood pressure meds. Now we have you on four and it's still not controlled. This should be a red flag, um, especially if they're otherwise, um, you know, asymptomatic. Um, again, if they become symptomatic with sh increasing shortness of breath, pulmonary edema, that's a, a red flag that they're now moved on to preeclampsia from their chronic hypertension. Um, this is a little controversial, but uh, in those patients, uh, in patients who might be at risk for preeclampsia, you might say, well, why don't we, why don't we have a way to monitor uh, the chronic hypertensives to like maybe have a marker earlier that they're going to develop preeclampsia. Well, um, there is a lot of work done, uh, being done and has been done on biomarkers that might be circulating that can cue you to say this chronic hypertensive patient will have preeclampsia in the future. But the ACOG does not endorse them because they're just not as specific as they need to be right now. Um, Doppler velocimetry, which is Dopplering um, the uterine artery, actually is helpful, but again, it's not recommended. So just close history, physical, and uh, monitoring of labs, et cetera, is the way to check when these women's transition to uh, preeclampsia. <laughs> Um, the chronic hypertensive, which we'll, you guys will probably be the most interested in, is um, mostly adult practitioners. Um, for them, again, the standard, the diagnosis is 140 over 90, which for us is not true, but for them, chronic hypertensive is that cutoff, and it's hypertension diagnosed before pregnancy or before 20 weeks. Um, so if it's after the 20 weeks and they've never been hypertensive before, it's not chronic hypertension, obviously. Um, or you can diagnose someone as chronic hypertensive tension if they remain hypertensive for greater than 20 weeks after they deliver their baby. Um, what's the overall incidence? It's really low, like I said, because usually people with chronic hypertension are too old to have a baby. Um, but the incidence of highest in older um, patients, African American and obese. Um, ideally, any person you treat for hypertension in your clinic, you should counsel them if they're still of childbearing age or able to have kids that you need to address the medic medications before they get pregnant because of the teratogenicity. All right, so what is the increased risk for uh, pregnant patients with chronic hypertension? Up to 25%, one in four, again, will move from chronic hypertension to have that superimposed preeclampsia. Um, and then for the uncommon, uncomplicated chronic hypertensions that don't develop preeclampsia, they're still at a higher risk for having a C-section or postpartum hemorrhage. So you might have you know, smooth sailing all through pregnancy with your chronic hypertensive patient, but know that there's still risks. Even if you made it to the finish line, they still have risks during uh, delivery. Um, Again, if you have the superimposed preeclampsia, it's worse, high risk for placental abruption, small for gestational age, premature delivery, et cetera. Um, in patients with chronic hypertension, this is one of the things that I learned while trying to prepare this, is um, there's an up to 80% greater risk of your fetus having a congenital heart defect if you have chronic hypertension. And what came first, the chicken or the egg? We don't really know. Is it because, um, well, we do know that the risk is higher of having the congenital heart defect, even if you're not on therapy, medical therapy. So it's probably not all just being treated with pills that's causing this. Um, it's probably a little bit of both. The risk goes up if you need to be treated, but is it because the blood pressure is higher that the defect is there? Or is it because you're treating that blood pressure? Um, not certain. Um, but counseling, of course, on these risks is, is required, really. It should be required. If you have a patient who can have a baby who is chronic hypertension, they need to know this, um, that if they get pregnant, there's a risk. Uh, 
um, the management for chronic hypertension, this diastolic is a, the goal, according to ACOG, is a little bit lower than for your preeclampsic or your gestational. It's 105, but 160 over 105. Um, and it's the same. It's kind of like uh, I'm a broken record up here, but the same med medication you would use, methylopalabetal or methetapine. The big uh, thing to remember for the chronic hypertensives is anyone who's on an ACE inhibitor, an ARB, et cetera, an um, aldosterone receptor um, antagonist, uh, they need to be taken off that if they're planning to get pregnant. It's just as simple as that. I think in my practice, um, when I'm finally done training, if I have someone who can have a baby, I'm going to do everything to avoid prescribing them an ACE, an ARB, or an aldosterone antagonist because the, that risk is just, you might as well avoid it if you can. Um, and then, of course, the chronic hypertensives, they're at high risk, um, as were the uh, the previous group that we discussed. So you can consider a low-dose aspirin if you are worried about them being complicated. Moving on to gestational hypertension, it's the most common reason that a pregnant woman will be hypertensive. Um, it's a temporary increase. Um, it's often called pregnancy-induced hypertension, um, and it occurs just like preeclampsia after 20 weeks, but there are no lab abnormalities. It's um, 6 to 17% in nulliparous women and 2 to 4% in multiparous. Um, the increased risk is um, multifetal pregnancy, obese, overweight, all the common kind of risk factors for uh, the hypertensive disorders we previously discussed that cut off for therapy. Again, if I could, I feel like I've said it a million times, 160 over 110, and don't treat them unless you really have to. What is their prognosis? If you have a female that you see for this uh, gestational hypertensive hypertension in your clinic, 25% with the chronic or gestational hypertension develop the preeclampsia. So they're just kind of like the chronic hypertensives. They're at risk. 20% will probably have gestational hypertension again if they get pregnant again. Um, it's um, for me being an adult cardiologist, I think a very important point is ask your women, your female patients, if they were preeclamptic, if they had just gestational hypertension, because it actually does affect their risk in the future. Um, it is a definitely a marker. We don't know exactly why, but for chronic hypertension to develop and cardiovascular disease to be present in the future. Um, and we'll dive a little bit deeper into that. So the baby is delivered. We got her through. Now what? Don't forget that the preeclampsia uh, pre and eclampsia can still develop post-delivery, so up to four weeks. Um, and monitoring the blood pressure up to 72 hours is the recommendation, the official recommendation from ACOG, and again in seven to 10 days. And really patient education is where this fits in because as any of us know who've had kids, they don't keep you in the hospital for very long anymore, so you're out on your own. Um, so. Uh, educating patients on symptoms of uncontrolled blood pressure or eclampsia, very important. Headaches, abdominal pain, um, visual changes, all very important. Um, and then the CV outcomes that I briefly mentioned later in life for the gestational hypertensive patients and even the preeclamptics. Apparently, there's a, apparently a two-fold increase in CV disease for all women with a history of preeclampsia and preterm delivery less than 34 weeks in the setting of preeclampsia was an eight to tenfold increased CB risk. Um, they tried to adjust for preeclampsia being the main driver of this versus other, you know, other reasons, and they, they couldn't. They couldn't attribute it just to preeclampsia, um, and maybe it has to do with the risk factors that exist in patients with preeclampsia, but nonetheless, when you see a patient, ask them, did you have preeclampsia? Did you have high blood pressure? Did you have any sort of disorder of your blood pressure when you were pregnant? It matters. Um, and then recurrent preeclampsia had an increased CV death and disease earlier in life than women who only had preeclampsia in their first pregnancy. Um, so pregnancy history matters. That's the take-home point from, from all of those. Um, aside from how to manage them, it matters. When you see a new patient, you should be asking, A, have they, when did they have menopause? How many babies did they have? And what were the cause or the complications, if any, of those pregnancies? So back to the warm-up, because I'm getting tired of talking about 160 over 110, probably as much as you're sick of hearing me say that. Um, so this, the 36-year-old lady with the IVF and the twin pregnancy with a blood pressure of 155 over 85, what is the most common form of hypertension in pregnancy? And I hope we can all say that's gestational, but 
preeclampsia is the most common one to complicate it. What are the next steps? CBC, it's kind of like when someone gets admitted to the hospital, what are you going to do? CBC, CMP, maybe get some urine studies, um, but every single person with high blood pressure in pregnancy needs that. What's her likely diagnosis? Again, gestational, as long as her blood, all of her labs are okay. What medications, if any, would you prescribe? None, because she's relatively uncomplicated if her labs are okay and her blood pressure is less than the cutoff last time of 160 or 110, <laughs> and immediately postpartum, what's she at risk for? Of course, no matter what, she's still at risk for the preeclampsia, anyone with elevated blood, pr blood pressure during pregnancy, um, and she's at risk for recurrent gestational hypertens hypertension in the short term, but long-term hypertension and CV disease, which she should be uh, counseled on. Here are my references, and thank you, and there's my little one that I had. <laughs>